what's happening today is the sales development reps are being told what used to work 15 or 20 years ago. All the SDR sales development reps are told, you know, don't go dealing with those low level minions, go straight to the top. So number one thing is don't look for a silver bullet. Number two is that is all the stuff that's changed in sales. What hasn't changed in sales? We are human beings and we can help each other. Hi, I'm Will Barron, host of the world's biggest B2B sales show, The Salesman Podcast, where we help you not just hit your targets, but really thrive in sales. Make sure you click subscribe if you haven't already and join Sales Nation. Let's meet today's guest. Hey, it's Brian Burns, the host of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast on iTunes and everywhere else you get a podcast. In this episode, you're going to learn the tribal nature of B2B selling, why you should never pitch a potential customer straight off the bat, and why people just aren't meeting with you. Let's jump right in. Why do potential customers, super open-ended question here, obviously, why do potential customers just not want to meet with salespeople? Well, I don't think it's much of a mystery, <laughs> you know, because I don't know about you, but you know, my email box is full of spam. Uh, my phone rings all day long with local numbers that I know aren't anybody I know. I put them to voicemail. Uh, you know, th there's anything from salespeople to scammers. And uh, I got to ask you, you know, what pitch would you really listen to? You know, is there any pitch that you really want to hear? And I think what's happening today is the sales development reps are being told what used to work 15 or 20 years ago because that's where in the last time their sales trainer actually sold, right? And all they're doing is, oh, personalize it more. Oh, you no, know, do it on multiple channels simultaneously. Text them while you're cold calling them and email them while you're on LinkedIn with them. And, and it's all about the sales rep. It has nothing to do about the person. And that's why nobody cares anymore. I think we we kind of um, are in this perfect storm where, you know, all these tools came out in the last three years to make it so easy to annoy the hell out of everybody that everybody is shut down. I mean, why do we have caller ID? Right. So we know who's calling. Right. When we see the subject line or we don't know who it's from, why would we open it? <laughs> you know, is there anything that's so compelling that I want to, you know, reduce my expenses by 50 percent or triple my revenue? And do I believe it because I got 17 people telling me I can do that? You know, it is just so noisy out there. I don't know you. I don't like you and I don't trust you. So. You know, as they say in England, bugger off, right? It's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I th that's probably the uh, the the least heavy kind of uh, phrase that's being thrown <laughs> around at salespeople at the moment. So the, we're going to dive into hopefully how we can break through some of this noise or how we can do things differently in a second. But something really stood out then, uh, Brian. I'm going to use your words. The, we're not we're not giving people a pitch that they want to hear. Does that exist? No, no. Do, uh, and, it, like, does does it, exist? Do, does a pitch that people want to hear exist, or is that the paradox here that we shouldn't be pitching people at all? I, 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 well, of course, it depends on the sale and how complex it is. You know, if you're selling uh, refills to your copier cartridges, you might be out, and a pitch might work. Okay, or if somebody happens to um, have their ice maker broken in the refrigerator. They may need a refrigerator repairman, right? So you may find that needle in the haystack. Uh, other than that, you know, what pitch do you want to hear? Is there anything that I could call you up to today and in 30 seconds get enough of your attention that you would listen to me? There might be two or three things, right? But most of us have avoided that. We, we have all these protections in place and we're bombarded by salespeople, especially, you know, all the SDR sales development reps are told, you know, don't go dealing with those low level minions, go straight to the top. <laughs> right. And you're like, well, the people straight to the top are getting it 10 times as much. And that, that, that's all I hear from reps, you know, and they send me the emails and I look at them and I'm like, I just roll my eyes. I'm like, this has nothing to do with them. It's all about you. And this is a surprise. 
I mean, I'm sure you're on LinkedIn. You get the request from somebody in a country you never heard of. And then the, then you get three paragraphs of what they can do for you. You know, and they don't they haven't checked out your profile. They don't know who you are. They've added no value to you. Uh, it, it's just it, it's re we're really at a brick wall right now. And nobody some people are talking about it, but everybody's answering it in the same way they did 20 years ago is come up with a better value proposition, a more enticing pitch, an insight they may not be aware of. Right. And you're like, eh, you still have to get a conversation going. Right. They still have to answer the phone. How do I get around the gatekeeper? You know, if I hear these objections one more time, I'm just ready to kill somebody. <laughs> well, Brian, I got a pitch today that very likely you're going to get the same pitch in LinkedIn if you accept people on there like I do uh, within the next few days. It was someone asking whether they can come on the podcast and they pitched me in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I've never talked about Spanish on the podcast whatsoever. There is no reason for in anyone's mind why they would be pitching me in Spanish. I had to use Google Translate to suss out what the what the kind of question was. And it was only because I mentioned, only because it said the sales and podcast in English, it, that I didn't just delete the message anyway. So very likely with your show and the size of it as well, you'll, you'll get the same pitch from this individual. So with all this said, Brian, I'm, and most of the people listening are probably somewhat depressed right now thinking that you were going to give them a, a golden nugget, a quick answer. What is the solution to breaking through the noise and then giving people a, a reason to speak with us? Well, I mean, it, it, that's the problem is they're looking for the golden nugget. They're looking for the silver bullet. They're trying to treat the complex sale like the simple sale, like how I can get you on the phone, hold your attention, build your interest and then close for that 15 minute meeting with my AE, my account exec. You know, th this is what we're paying, you know, probably a million people in the U S to do. Right. And when I hear they get one cold outreach meeting a month, this is what I'm hearing one. And wow. I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty expensive meeting, right? You could literally fly them to a resort and take them out to dinner cheaper than paying that person to do it. Uh, so, so number one thing is don't look for a silver bullet. Number two is that is all the stuff that's changed in sales. What hasn't changed in sales? You're still a human being. I'm still a human being. Hopefully you have friends and family. I've got friends and family, probably not as many, but <laughs> right. We have connections. We have interests. We are human beings. And we can help each other. And when you help each other, you, you go from unknown to known. You become unliked to liked. And when you get the sense that the other person has your interest in mind, you become trusted. Right. We're, we're trying to do that in an email. Right. <laughs> well, that doesn't when, happen. When you say it like that, that makes total sense. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, right? It's insane. <laughs> it, it, you know, how many emails do you get like this? Hey, Will, love your podcast. Real huge fan. I'd like to come on. What I do is real estate development in Oklahoma where I flip houses, right? So it's completely, obviously, they didn't listen to your podcast. They're not a big fan. You know, they gave you a nice flattering thing. So you read the next thing and you're going, this is crazy. Why would I talk to you? Right. But they are sending out thousands of them. And then now you can do it with email merges. And and what I hear from the reps is, well, my manager still wants me to make 60 calls a day. Right. And it's like when I was in sales <laughs> back when you were probably in elementary school, <laughs> what everybody did was just call the movie theater 25 times a day. So it would look on the on their oh, charts. Wow. Right. It, everyone faked it. Like everyone's faking it with with uh, the CRM today. Mm. You know, people are basing AI information off of that stuff that's in the CRM. It's all made up. Right. I mean, we're forgetting what hasn't changed, that we are people. We're tribal people, meaning if you've seen what's going on in the U.S., you know, with the election in the last year, it is so tribal. You get on Facebook and you say one thing on one side or the other, and you just lost half your friends. 
right? You know, and, and then crazy things like anything. People have these really strong beliefs and we're forgetting that. We think we're at work and we can have this enticing value proposition that marketing gave us, or we hire a copywriter to come in and really polish it up and make it more personalized. Oh, I, I see you went to school here. Now, now you're going to be interested, right? I, I think what people are forgetting is that if you're selling something that's complicated, it's going to take time. It's going to be multiple meetings, right? Like what you did and what I did. You can't do that in an email, right? You can start with an email. You can start with a cold call. Uh, you can start with a social uh, outreach. But you've got to understand that, that person's a person and you've got to quit acting like a salesperson because that is slightly above child molester in the order of desirability, right? You know, just, the next is politician, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, or lawyer above that. It's like someone paid to lie, right? You know, it, it, that's kind of this level of trust that we have. And, and we really erode it when we're not being sincere and genuine. So is this a, a mindset shift that we need to make rather than, and that's the 80-20, that's the 20 that's going to get us 80% of the results versus a technique over email or a new way to leave a voicemail. Is, is all this to, I guess, raise our standards as salespeople, pitch our, I don't want to use that word pitch now after the first kind of five minutes of the conversation, Brian, we, we need to elevate ourselves to a, an industry expert, trusted advisor, and then stay there because a industry expert wouldn't be spamming people, right? They wouldn't be cold call well, I mean, spamming people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's nice to say. And being an industry expert is good, but that takes too long, right? None of us have time for that, right? You know, I mean, you, you, what you sold, could you be an industry expert? You, you know, you'd have to be like a doctor, right? You probably knew the equipment better than they did. So yeah, let, right? let me give you that as a, an example then. And you can tell me where we were with this. Because I've never really had to cold call anyone. I've never really had to... I've walked into theaters selling uh, medical devices to surgeons and a pop head and said, hi, you know, can I pop back later on? That's, that's as much cold outreach as I've ever really done. And that's because I was always pitched as, a, as an industry expert. But the way I describe that, perhaps we're not talking about an industry expert, perhaps we're talking about a, a regional expert. That might be a better way to describe it. I worked for one of the biggest medical device companies in endoscopy. I then moved to the biggest competitor. So I knew the products either side. I worked for both companies for kind of two and a half, three years each. So I wasn't a expert in anything other than my specific niche of product, but surgeons would proactively call me when they needed help on either the competitor's product or my own products. So when I say industry expert, perhaps you can help me here and there's a better way to define that. But I mean a, a, a regional right. expert, an expert for our specific customers. Yeah, I mean, that is good. But so you were leveraging social proof based off of the two brands you worked for. Mm -hmm. They didn't know Will Barron, but they knew the two companies. Yep. Right. So and and some people today have that with, if they're working for a big name company. Uh, and that may be a positive or a negative thing. But a lot of people are working for tiny, no name companies where people don't really know what they do, don't understand what it does don't understand why they would be interested or why it would be valuable. And people have a hard time having or starting a conversation because that's how sales started, right? Th those doctors wanted to talk with you because they wanted to be aware of the, the newest stuff. They, they wanted to protect themselves and their patients and have the best possible equipment they, they possibly could get access to, right? So they listened to you and you knew about it because you were trained in it, but you weren't a urologist, right? You, but you, you could tell the difference between the two products. And should you be able to do that? You should. If you can't have <laughs> a 30 minute conversation about your own product, um, that's kind of scary. And if you can't, you know, understand what's important to your client, you know, because what was important to them was, you know, helping their patients, successful operations, pain-free operations, quick recovery, uh, uh, 
minimizing malpractice, you know, covering their bots as well. All of those things are important to them. And if you can talk to them about it, that's important. As you, as you but, describe this, Brian, the, there was one extra layer of this, and I never realized I was doing it at the time. But if I wanted to get into a competitor's account, all I would do um, with both companies would be take the surgeons out on a training day. Clearly, you know, after 4 p.m., it's just a piss up and, and free drinks and a nice meal. And half, you know, probably 80% of the reason they want to go to these training days is because of that. But it looks good on the um, paperwork. It looks good on their record. So if I wanted to get into one of these accounts, that's probably how I would engage them. That's how I'd jump in. I'll get a sign off on my manager to kind of put on put on a day or invite a surgeon. They're both, um, one was a German company, one was a Japanese company, but they were both, most optics and glasses made in Germany. So we take them over to the, show them around the factory, all this good stuff. So is that the approach we need to make? Because that doesn't seem... And again, I didn't realize I was doing it at the time. It was more fluke than anything. But it seems that I'm I'm offering them something up front without a pitch, without kind of nailing right. them and drilling them down into my CRM funnel. Is that what we need to be doing to get these conversations going? Yes, we, we need to start talking about what they care about, right? And in doing it in a social situation is much better than doing it over WebEx or Zoom or Skype or anything. Uh, that, that's certainly valuable. And they want to learn about this stuff. They're interested in learning about it. Certainly, uh, you know, I sold mostly to software developers, architects, uh, VPs or CIOs uh, through my career and uh, so chief security officers. They want to know what's the hottest, newest thing out there because that enhanced their career, their value their salaries and their marketability. And if, if I talked about features and functions, you know, they'd be bored to death. But if I talked <laughs> about capabilities and where the industry is going and why it's going that direction and how that helps them, that's what they care about, right? They, they don't want to hear about my product. They want to hear about what's going to help them. Right. And I think it's this primal thing that we can't really get over not talking about ourselves. <laughs> right. And, and you see it all the time. You know, every every email, it's like it's all about you. Right. You know. So what does this what does this look like real practically, Brian, then for someone who's listening to this, who perhaps is going, oh, shit, I've just spent the past six months spamming out emails and I could be replaced by a bringing potential customers on a holiday resort, as you, des as you, you, as you described before, and that would be a cheaper for the company to do. Someone who's listening to this, perhaps a, a, a SDR, whatever the title they want to call themselves, they're doing this outreach. I guess, one, how do we know what these people want to speak about before we engage in a conversation with them? And then two, how do we get that conversation going without this weird email that we've all had of, hey, here's a white paper on what's happening in the industry. I'd like to call you. Uh, well, if you don't know what they care about, then you, you've got a, a little bit of an education because and, and that, that is a problem because what I hear mostly is people go, well, we got uh, two days of CRM training and then we got two days of product training. And then they gave us a phone and uh, LinkedIn Navigator and said, get three meetings a week. That, that, that's pretty much what I hear. Uh, but you're calling up somebody and if you don't understand why they would care, you know, ask yourself, what what's their day like? What keeps them uh, from getting fired? What keeps them from getting promoted? What keeps them from enjoying their day at work? Uh, what's going to help? What, how's my thing going to help them? And what do they want to talk about? Right. What, what's going to illuminate their career, their quality of life and what are they going to care about? I mean, when you meet somebody at a party, you don't go up and tell them about your podcast, do you? Well, no, <laughs> no one care. gives a shit. <laughs> no one cares, right? <laughs> you know, I don't know about you. My mother still doesn't know what a podcast is. No, right? My, my goes, dad's what, what, never listened to the show ever. <laughs> Does he know what it is, though? Um, well, it gets downloaded to his phone and he's, I've left a review from his phone onto the show. 
He's no idea how to play it, though. Well, you're, you're, uh, must be a generation behind. But anyways, they, they just don't know. And they don't, you know, the, you know, she picks up the newspaper and starts reading. It's like <laughs> nobody cares about you. Right. They care about themselves and they love talking about themselves. So you talking about your product isn't moving you forward. You've got to find a way of engaging them in a conversation that is relevant to their work that is adjacent to what you do. Okay. Should we it, it, spend time, Brian? So I'm, I'm interrupting you here um, because I've got loads of questions coming up as we're going through. Should we then spend time with uh, in developing our personal brand? Should we be creating content to send them to start a conversation? How should we also be, I guess, framing ourselves of all of this uh, if we don't want to be perceived just as a salesperson? Well, I mean, I don't think you have to write anything. I, I think if you could find content that's about the problem that you solve that's written by someone else um, is super helpful. And then asking them their thoughts, opinions, or ideas that they, reactions that they have to it. I mean, is this a priority for you or is this a back burner issue? Right? You know, and, and if you can come across as, you know, just a guy or a girl in the industry who's just trying to make your own way, and we all are, right? You know, some 23-year-old SDR, you know, you got to understand, th th these people you're calling, if you approach them the right way, they, they want to help you. They might not want to buy from you, but they probably are willing to help you, right? They're, they're like, you know, we're probably not a good match, but maybe try this place over here or, you know, try this person in this, this department. Instead of you just pounding and pounding and pounding and I, I see it all day on YouTube and you know in the blogs you got to come up with a better more personalized pitch and I go yes that will help it will it honestly will but going from three percent to four percent isn't going to excite many people right I mean we're recording this on a Monday and I can just imagine the SDR is going into work on a Monday going looking at that phone and it gets 60 <laughs> dials to me. And, and I mean, literally, I worked at a startup, right? Early, early stage startup. You know, the first round of salespeople, they literally flew us to a place in New Jersey and had a manager watch us cold call because they didn't believe we would cold call anywhere, you know, on our own. And, and, and you know, we were... Literally had to get up at four in the morning to get a flight up to New Jersey, drive a half an hour south, sit in an office and cold call all day while the manager was banging us on the head and then fly home that night. I mean, it, 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 it just re was ridiculous. And you get like one or two meetings. Right. But th there's just smarter ways of doing it. And, and the great salespeople don't have to do that. You know, I'm sure you've seen. You know, I haven't made a cold call in four years, you know, honest to God. And my, my schedule's booked, right? And I, I talk to people who are interested. If I want to talk to somebody, uh, you know, I, I can very quickly get access to them in, in a very natural, sequential way at, that doesn't feel pressured or pushy or, or even have an ask. What would your... You know, process be what, what you want to and can divulge here brian just to just to paint a picture in the audience's mind of the steps that they should be thinking about Wait, okay so the, the major steps and if, you, if i tell you exactly people are going to do it it's not going to work 100 percent of the time and they're going to blame will and brian right so <laughs> it, it it is like learning to play the guitar the piano or any musical instrument right it looks really simple until you try it right <laughs> right you know it's like you see somebody do a cartwheel it looks like you can do it right you ever try and do a cartwheel it, doing a cartwheel was one of my goals last year so i have a list of business goals list of just <laughs> stupid goals and one of them was, and, and don't get me wrong here, I'm six foot three and I'm lanky as hell. So by the time I try and do a cartwheel and my hands hit the floor, my feet are either kind of blobbled all over the place. So I know damn well how hard it is and it looks so simple. But yeah, I've never managed it, Brian. It's one of the, one of the biggest failures of, of last year for me. 
and, and I'm old enough and smart enough not to try. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll count that. So, but, but basically, the steps are you have to go from unknown to known. And how can you do that? How do you do that in real life? Um, you, I don't know if you're single or not, but it, when you go to, I'm sure you've been to an event where you know nobody. Nobody there knows you. You know nobody. Okay. You can either sit in the corner and have a cocktail and watch the TV or go home, or you can talk to people, right? And what do you do? You say You say hi, right? Yeah, you, you put a big smile on your face, right? What, what's more welcoming? A smile says, I am unthreatening and friendly, right? We're, we're, we're primitive little animals, right? What do dogs do in the park, right? You get the angry little dog that goes, you know, that tries to scare people away because I'm scared of you, doggy. And then you get the friendly dog that jumps up and down and, just, and overdoes it. So we have to go from unknown to known in a way without an ask, right? So there's millions of ways of doing that. Then, then you have to become light, which means you do something for them without asking for something in return. Boom. Then you, you start a conversation. You ask a question. You look for advice. You look for feedback. You look for their thoughts. Uh, you collaborate on something that uh, benefits them. And all of a sudden, now you can start talking about what they do and what you do. And that is how people have communicated for centuries. But now we think just because we're, we're on the other end of the screen, I've got the right to send all of this stuff in a three-paragraph email or interrupt your day by calling you and telling you how great your life is going to be if you buy my stuff. And I'm not hanging up until you do, right? And that, that is not, I mean, that works in a simple sale, right? You're like when you go to buy that car, that guy's not going to let you off the lot, right? He's not. And he shouldn't, right? That's a simple sale. He knows if you leave that day, you're not buying the car. So they chase you. They hold your driver's license in the U.S. They go, oh, you want to, well, we need your license. And I go, if I don't have my license when I'm driving your car, do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> How about if I get pulled over? They want your license because they want you to come back and they, they're not going to give it to you until you buy your car. Right. All that trickery and stuff works in the simple sale and people try and migrate it to the complex sale. And it's a disaster. Right. Because, you know, executives and people in business don't have time for it. I'll give you, um, uh, or you, uh, and the, the audience here as well. I'm here, Brian. Brian of, of the step by step process I use to get a lot of the uh, the ad sponsors we have on the podcast, and it's, it's 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 seamless to what you just described. Of I'll reach out with, hey, you know, podcasts are doing X, Y, Z, Z, Z in some kind of article, and that starts off sounds a bit spammy. The next line though is, is there anyone in your organization that knowing all this information of how useful podcasts are and being on that platform? that we can bring on the show to talk about essentially helping the audience, helping sales nation, but then pitch your product at the end of the show. And then I get them to put a specific tracking link at the end of that. So I bring them on. I love the word you use then of collaborate. I collaborate with this organization to come on the show. We do an epic show. They get a tracking link at the end of it. Sales nation goes and buys a load of their products because it's relevant. It's appropriate to the audience. And then they go, oh crap. If we've just one episode, we can do X revenue. It makes total sense to sponsor 12 episodes and do X, Y, Z revenue on the back of it. And it's seamless. There's no weird close. There's no manipulation tactics of buying cars and, and things like that. And it's just seamless, right? And that's how I've, I guess that's how I've always done business. So just trying to establish that collaboration point as, as quick as possible. Are there any other, because you know, I know you're, you're, you've stopped traveling more recently, but with all the companies that you've consulted with in the past, are there any standout ways that, they've collaborated with potential customers to give a, a few more examples to the audience of a process like this. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, when I did sell, I, I sold very expensive software, enterprise software. So deals were, you know, a tiny deal was 50 K a big deal was like two and a half to 5 million. And you're not going to do that in one meeting, right? 
And what I would do, you know, everybody would want to, you know, have the big meeting where everyone gets together. And this is what everyone does today. Let's, oh, we're selling demos. So the AE, the account exec gets on, gives the demo and, you know, they record it and everything. They analyze it. And of course, the close is send us a proposal. And the dumbest thing you can do is send them a proposal because then you have no control, no involvement. That proposal sits on a disk somewhere in the cloud <laughs> and one out of 30 get processed and procured. You're not engaged with them anymore. You don't understand how to sell, right? And you think they understand how to buy. I've, I've worked at 12 companies in my life. No one ever taught me how to buy anything. Everyone was, you don't, you don't buy anything, you know? I, I had a company credit card with no limit, you know, and, but if you bought something, with it, it was like, no one teaches anybody how to buy. So this buyer's journey is the biggest bullshit going on in our industry right now. Everyone thinks there's a buyer's journey. Who, who taught them the journey? Where's the, <laughs> the, the here's the journey. Hey, w welcome. Welcome to XYZ company. Here's our buyer's journey, Will. This is how we buy stuff. Nobody knows how to buy stuff because they don't want to spend money. You're doing an unnatural act when you're selling something to a company. So you have to be the deal Sherpa to get them through the system. And if you don't know how to do that, you got to learn how to do that. Okay. Otherwise, good. I'm, I'm sorry. I was, I was just going to say, I was going to ask if, because it's seemingly a lot of this, if we strip away all the communication, all the, or the digital communication, all the, the platforms that we're all using to spam people, the email, the phone. It seems like what we're describing here is essentially going to some kind of industry event, saying hi to people, and then over the next kind of few months, weeks, sending them useful stuff, trying to collaborate with them, taking the surgeons away for training, and then naturally they get used to the product, they want to use it. There's no weird demo with my surgeons I used to sell to. It was, oh, but of course we're doing the training with our equipment, oh, of course this equipment is way better than what they're used to. So naturally they want it and it, there's nothing weird about it and it's just seamless and makes sense. So if we strip away all the digital communication that we're all trying to leverage to turbocharge our outreach and, and our ability to get in front of more people more often, do we need to think about this? And as a, as a way to sum this up, we need to think about it like going to an industry event and networking with people and building business relationships. Is that the, is that the, I guess the, the, the hack here that we need to strip back all the rest of it. And that's the layers on top, but the basic principle that we need to put across is meet with people and, and build a network. Well, I, I think we, uh, the worst thing you can do is go to an industry event, right? Because the only people there are people selling to each other, right? And then people who have nothing better to do, you know, I look at Dreamforce and I'm like, who, what CEO in their right mind would let their VP of sales spend a week at the end of the quarter in San Francisco getting drunk, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. So guess who goes? Sales ops, you know, it, it, it's a gift to people who have no authority within a company. <laughs> so that's what they do. And, and all of a sudden you get everybody sitting around listening to Michelle Obama. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. That's really going to increase sales. No, you have to go to the customer site and actually help them. If you can't go to the site, you get online with them and help them. And, you know, my approach when I was selling it was, you know, everybody wanted to sell consulting, like what you call training. No, make the doctors pay for that training, right? Most companies wanted th those doctors to pay or my engineers to pay. I go, no, no they're not going to pay. And you're starting a sales cycle when you do that, right? Because that's money. Somebody's got to transact that money. No, I do it all for free. I'd be like, well, let's, get, let's get it in here. Let's get it working. I mean, one company, I had actually transferred their whole product onto our product. It was 10 times faster, and we hadn't negotiated a price yet. So guess what leverage I had when we negotiated a price, right? That they would have had to try and pull us out of the product, <laughs> right? And reduce its performance by 10, right? So you have enormous leverage. 
right? The more you're engaged with the client, the more likely you are to win. And if you're in that beauty contest uh, sale, like most of us are, where, where you have, you know, five or 10 contestants, everybody's a good singer, everybody looks good in a bathing suit, you know, and one person picks or they flip, a, you know, or, or they buy three, right? And everyone's got a different one. And it, it's like, you have to be in control of that process and forget about this buyer's journey and go back to the idea that we're people and we're not companies. I mean, and we are outside the tribe. Their tribe is in that building. That's their cave, right? You're trying to knock on the cave. Hey, stranger out here would like some of your food <laughs> and some of your resources. And they're like, no, thanks. Right? <laughs> right? If you show up with a gift, oh, here's some food and here's, here's some pelts and some blankets and stuff. Right. I think you're on something here, Brian, of, of a book, Tribal Selling. And we go into uh, both tri building a tribe and building a cult are very similar of having your own language and being able to communicate on their level and all that kind of stuff. There's there's definitely a book or a course or a series there somewhere. Um, but I want to want to wrap up here, Brian, with one thing. And the answer might be tell them to listen to this damn episode of the show. But what do we do if we are a salesperson listening to this, SDR, we're an account executive, whatever our title is, what have I been? I've been a territory manager, account manager, sales specialist, whatever our title is. What do we do if we go, oh, this all makes sense. We need to give first. We need to get our product in front of them. That makes total sense. If our product is this good and we get it in front of them, then they're going to love it. We're going to knock price off the table. We're going to have all the leverage I you describe. What do we do if our company doesn't allow us to do this? Or more specifically, we have a sales manager who says, nope, 60 calls a day, that's your lot, get over there. What what do we say to that sales manager to let us experiment perhaps? Or do we move to a new company? What's the answer for the salespeople listening who are in that predicament? Well, most people are in that predicament. I would say 95% are because it's always easy to count calls than it is count quality, right? It always will be. You know, and everyone's faking it today. And all these managers who think, oh, well, look at look at my little dashboard. Isn't it pretty? It's like you, you know, I, I worked at a company where they said we want it 300 percent of pipeline for uh, our quota. And everybody from the, the bottom rep to the VP of sales knew it was BS. Right. So everybody just adhered to it. <laughs> so it, what, that's exactly what you do. You adhere to it, right? And you got to do whatever it takes to do your job because they're not going to fire you if you get your quota and your meetings or whatever it is. Uh, but they, they're they not going to keep you because you had your KPIs in place. You made the 60 calls, but you didn't get a meeting, Right. What are they going to say? They're going to say you're not very good at those. You need to personalize them more. And, um, you know, we, we need that, that uh, you know, 60-year-old sales trainer back in here telling us to, you know, <laughs> the guy who lived down by the river and, you know, the motivational speaker to come back in and teach us to get us ramped up and more coffee because that's for closers. And it's like uh, we're forgetting that it's a human being and we're applying the simple sale skills to the complex sale, which does the exact opposite of what it should do. So do we need to just go out there and do what it takes to get the results? Because then we're not getting sacked versus follow the plan. It's not working. The ship's going down where we can get sacked. Is it? Is it just about getting the results? Is that what we need to focus on here? Well, I mean, no rep, very few reps who make their number will get canned, right? And today, of uh, what 50 some percent of the reps it, it's stacked against us now when i started in sales it was like 80 percent would make quota today it's i had a, a commission expert and he goes uh we target for 65 and i'm like and all that is is commission expense control it's not sales leadership or management so the people but the company wants revenue they want deals and no manager, and managers really don't care how you get it, right? But when you're not getting it, 
then they they're all over you on this on the the data entry BS, right? And and they know you, everyone's making it up. Let, let's be <laughs> honest, it's all horseshit, right? <laughs> You know, it's the biggest scam going out there. It's right. It's like, what what does marketing do? Oh, we're behind on leads. So it's like, um, you know, what's the five easiest ways to increase your income? They'll put that blog out and it'll get like tons of, you know, responses. But they're not leads. They're contacts. You know, we, we've got to understand that we're selling to people, start conversations and get meetings and the sale will come. We've got to, you know, move at the pace that our customers move. You know, when do you go to a doctor, right? If you're a guy, I haven't been to a doctor in 20 years, right? You know, it's going to take a lot to get me to go to a doctor, right? <laughs> you know, the doctor could knock on my front door. He goes, Brian, I'm here. I want to see what's wrong with you. It's like, thanks for coming by. <laughs> you know, we even slam the door, right? you got to build the need before you start showing them the medicine and the solution to it. Look, I, I've, I'll wrap up with this and you can tell us about the, the podcast in a second, but I've got a real practical example of that. My girlfriend is a doctor. One of my oh. best mates is a helicopter paramedic, both top of the game in what they do. I hurt my finger at jujitsu the other week. Um, it's called, it's called mallet finger. I'd never heard of it before. They both told me I had mallet finger. Essentially, if everyone watching, you turn, um, the tendon in your finger and if you don't put a splint on it in a specific way you have a bent finger for the rest of your life it's not painful it's not the end of the world did i listen to them no they both told me exactly what i needed to hear but there was no persuasion there was no selling that went on with it so i ignored them both until what did i do oh I'll go oh my finger's a bit bent i best google this and find a solution so yeah I, you're, you're spot on with your doctor example and i'm i'm literally living it right now the reason i say this is I've done, last week I recorded 10 episodes of the show where I had the finger splint on. They're going to come out over the next three months or so. And so people are going to think I'm wearing this finger splint for months on end when you only need it on for a couple of weeks. Uh, but with that, Brian, to that random anecdote to wrap up the show, mate, tell us a little bit about your podcast, everyone who's listening, who's been, uh, I, you kind of depressed us at first and then you, you give us a, an enlightening insight at the end of the show there. So we all appreciate it. Tell us where we can find out more about your show, you and everything that you're up to. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast, uh, everywhere you get podcasts. And the idea is to cut through the, the BS, uh, the old school, you know, how to handle objections crap and tell you exactly what's working today. You know, I'm still selling every day and all day. And it's changed. It's changed tremendously, uh, literally in the last probably 16 months. I don't know if you've seen it. But it is very different out there, you know. So that's what it's all about. It's all about what works today and talking to people who are actually doing it and not only the techniques, the tools and the mindset, but it's just a fun conversation much like this. Perfect. Well, I'll link to that in the show notes for everyone who's driving over at salesman.org. And with that, Brian, I want to thank you for your time, your insights as always, mate, and for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will.